a beautiful way to begin worship on this holiday weekend. Welcome, whether you're joining us online or in person this morning. My name is Reverend Jennifer Finley, our Momentum and Discipleship Pastor, and it is a joy to be gathered in these different kinds of ways, perhaps particularly in the holiday weekend where we may be traveling. So for those of you online, welcome. For those of you in the room, welcome. We are glad to be worshiping together this morning. Good morning and welcome to worship those here and those online. I pray that you have a, a moving experience today, that the Lord touches you in a way that your heart is changed. My name is Scott Beard. I'm the lead pastor here, and I'm uh, just so excited to see all of you here, and those of you that are online, welcome as well. As we prepare our hearts and our minds for worship, a couple of announcements as we begin. Our worship is guided by our bulletins, either what you received as you came in um, or our online bulletin. And so we invite you to use those uh, to guide our responses. Hymnals are in your pews or the music is in our online bulletin. You'll also find a connection card, um, an online one, or there are a few in the pews and paper copies. That is a wonderful way to let us know how we can be in prayer for you or your family or those that you know and love. We would love to be in prayer for you. You can fill that out online or if you happen to fill out a paper copy, you can simply slip those in the offering boxes as you exit this morning. Um, and as our seasons are changing, so are a few things in the life of our congregation, and that's exciting. And so we're going to invite Teresa Eads, our children and youth director, to tell us a bit more about some exciting children's ministry things coming up. There is that. There we go. Now it's on. I won't yell at you. Um, we are going to begin Children's Church next week, which is super exciting to those of us who get to work with the children. So since um, we are having one service, we are going to have one opportunity for the children. So children will um, begin checking in anytime after 930 in the morning. We will check in upstairs. So if you just come in and go up the th to the third floor and we will begin children's church at 9 45 in room 305 i keep saying the wrong room so i had to write it down for myself in room 305 and then we will return the children to their families here in the sanctuary in time for communion so around 10 30 we'll bring the children back so for those of you who have children pre-k through fifth grade um, please bring them upstairs next week and we will be super excited to have that opportunity. If you are anything, have anything to do with education um, and you want to be a part of prayer partners or if you want to pray for someone, this is my final reminder for prayer partners because we will be handing those out next week. So if you are interested in praying for someone, please complete a form online or um, if you are interested in having someone prayed for, and we will hand those out and begin prayer partners next week. Thank you. It's always exciting as our seasons change and we truly invite you into those opportunities for prayer to be prayed for or to pray for someone else. And now as we begin, as we settle our hearts and our minds into worship, we do what we do each week. And we invite you if you are at home to find a source of light perhaps a candle, and light them as we do, acknowledging the power of the Holy Spirit in our midst, acknowledging that we are not alone, acknowledging that we are called into worship by our holy and gracious God. We're going to begin our worship with a call to worship you'll find in your bulletin or on your online bulletin. Let's stand and read it responsibly. Come to hear the word of God. Let, Let us, us worship, worship together, together this day. day. Come to do the word of God. Let, Let us, us worship, worship together, together this day. day. Come to experience comfort. Let, Let us, us worship, worship together, together this day. day. Come to experience challenge. Let, Let us, us worship, worship together, together this day. day. Come to find joy. Let us Let worship together, together this day. day. Come to find community. Let us worship, worship together, together this day. day. Come to encounter God. Let, Let us, us worship, worship together, together this day. day. 
If you take your hymnals and turn to number 555, it's the red hymnal. It's also in your online bulletin. We'll sing together, Forward Through the Ages. to join our voices together across time and space in this affirmation of faith. We believe in God, creator of the world and all people, and in Jesus Christ incarnate among us who died and rose again, and in the Holy Spirit present with us to guide, strengthen, and comfort. We rejoice in every sign of God's kingdom in the upholding of human dignity and community, in every expression of love, justice, and reconciliation, for the presence of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, we commit ourselves to the way of Christ, to take up the cross, to seek abundant life for all humanity, to struggle for peace with justice and freedom, to risk ourselves in faith, hope, and love, praying that God's kingdom may come. Amen. You may be seated. As we prepare to come our hearts and minds together in prayer, I'd like to lift up a few concerns. I'll let Jennifer start lighting those candles, but they, we want to certainly pray for those who have been affected by the hurricanes and all the flooding all from the south all the way up to New England. We want to pray for Brandy Schneider's family on the death of her mother, Karen Leffler, and Janet's sister. We want to pray for all the soldiers, of those who have come back from Afghanistan, and those who are adjusting to this, and their families, and those who are still there. We pray for those healthcare workers who are struggling with how to deal with the pandemic and how to get enough uh, available beds and care for them. And certainly want to continue to pray for those who've had personal struggles with that in their own lives. The pandemic and other health issues which are more exacerbated because of that problem. We know that there's so many people that are struggling in a variety of different ways. And I continue to encourage you when you come in to worship or after if you want to light one of these candles as a 
way of remembering that you're praying for a certain person or situation or for yourself. We believe there's power in prayer. And we believe that the Holy Spirit is represented through this flame, that the flame is a mystery, and yet it, it also points to reality of God's presence with us through His Son, Jesus Christ, whose Spirit we have in our hearts each and every day, wherever we go. I know sometimes that life can see, be, seem overbearing, that there's so many things happening and we don't know what to pray for. We don't even know who to pray for because there's so many things in our minds. And I encourage you to find just a few things that really speak to you and lift those up in prayer and lay your own life out there and say, Lord, I don't know the answers to a lot of these things, but I know you do. So I encourage you to, if you want to send prayer requests to us, you can do it on the connection cards that are in the back of the pews. You also can do that if you're online through direct messaging so that we, um, we will pray for you throughout the weeks and ongoing. Join me in prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, we gather today to worship you, to celebrate your love and the grace that you've extended to us each and every day. Lord, we look at the beautiful world around us and we marvel. We know it's so gorgeous. And we know that you are the master, that you've created all this for us. And Lord, we know that we don't deserve your love and yet you love us in spite of ourselves. You love us before we even know who you are. So Lord, we thank you for that love. We thank you for the care and guidance you've given us through our entire lives. And Lord, we lift up all these situations and names we've discussed, those who are struggling with the aftermaths of hurricanes and floods and fires and disease and death. There's so many things in our lives that crowd our minds that it makes it hard for us to focus on you, but we take these moments, say, Lord, we are here. We're listening for your voice. We're sharing our hearts. And when we don't have words, we know the Holy Spirit shares our thoughts for us. Lord, give us the strength to go forward into another day. And as we celebrate this weekend of, of uh, celebrating those who work, that includes all of us. All of us have work to do, and all of us called to be your hands and feet to the world. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to continue in worship with singing the hymn number 581. You may remain seated to sing this. It's 581 in your red hymnal or in your online bulletin. Lord, whose love through humble service. long for freedom still in grief we mourn our dead as O oh Lord your deep compassion heal the sick and free the soul use the love your spirit kindles still to save and make us whole as we worship grant us Till your love's revealing light In its height and depth and greatness Dawns upon our quickened sight Making known the needs and burdens Your compassion bids us bear Stirring us to tireless striving Your Called by worship to your service, forth in your dear name we go to the child. The
and health, good will and comfort, counsel, aid, and peace we give, that your servants, Lord, in freedom, may your mercy know and live. Our scripture this morning comes from the book of James, the second chapter. My brothers and sisters, do you with your acts of favoritism really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while to the one who is poor you say, stand there or sit at my feet, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law of transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but you do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do nothing, you do not supply their bodily needs. What is the good of that? So by faith itself, if it has no works, is dead. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Amen. Amen. Well, today we're starting in the uh, epistle of James. And we, it's called the epistle, meaning it's, a, it's another word for letter, like we call the epistles of Paul. And this, uh, this letter written by James is, uh, is not, we don't know exactly who wrote it. We believe, and traditionally it's believed, that James is the brother of Jesus. And so he was a leader in the early church, and we believe that he's the one that wrote this down. We, uh, we also have this idea from some of the context of the, of the letter that it was probably written around 30 to 60 years after Jesus' life. So this is sometime in the future, and James is a He's writing to a group of churches, not an individual church, which is a little bit different than the letters we're more familiar with from Paul, where he writes to a specific church about some specific problems going on there. In the, in the book of James, he's writing to, it says in the first line, to the 12 tribes in dispersion, if you look at the beginning of the, of the uh, book of James. So he's writing to a group of churches that are trying to figure out what it means to truly be Christian as we do today, right? I mean, sometimes even today we're trying to figure out what it means to be truly Christian. We can come up with a lot of different ways we can be Christian, but there's so many different flavors, so to speak, you know? It's kind of like Baskin Robbins, the 31 flavors of Christian, but it's like tens of thousands of different denominations of Christians. But we are unified in one thought, that Jesus Christ is our Savior. But in those times, it was complicated because they were trying to figure out whether you first had to be a Jew in order to be a Christian. And you could understand why they would think that because Jesus was a Jew himself. And this came through the Jewish tradition that you would then understand the Messiah had arrived. It was Jesus. And this idea of being Jewish, then becoming Christian was something that was often repeated. But we know that it's refuted in several other places in the scripture that Jesus came for all people, Jews and Gentiles. So this is part of what James is approaching and helping them to understand. The thrust of the book of James is more like a wisdom literature or an extended sermon than it is a letter dealing with a specific problem. So it's, it's kind of an overall guidebook about what it means to be Christian and how to live out your life. What, what's the marks of true Christianity? And some people have issues with the book of James because they don't like the fact that he emphasizes the fact that in order to show your faith, you have works that do that. And so many times people think, well, you're trying to make this a, a contrast. And, uh, but it's, that's not really what he's saying. We're going to delve, dig into that a little bit more. But what James is really saying is this is what it means to follow the way, the way of Jesus Christ. 
to do the things that he's calling us to do. So I'll admit that I'm one of those folks that has a complicated relationship with this book, <laughs> perhaps this passage in particular. I remember when I was in high school and I was in a Bible study and my youth director at the time was leading this Bible study and we did what a lot of group Bible studies do. We sat around a table and as we were reading a passage, we would read it out loud, go around the room and my turn came and we were on this passage and we got to the end of it. And uh, I remember reading out loud that last piece. So by faith itself, if it has no works is dead. And I remember pausing for a moment, finishing up what I was reading. And when we were done, looking at my youth pastor in the eye and saying, okay, but didn't somehow we talk about like last week that there's grace and there's faith and isn't there someplace else in the Bible that says we are saved by grace through faith? Yeah, I was that kid in high school, the one that the teacher really doesn't want to have around because they ask the questions. Uh, I don't really remember now what my youth pastor said beyond the fact that he looked at me and said, yeah, you have hit on a conversation the church and Christians have been having for centuries. I think that is indeed what the letter of James broadly and this passage in particular forces us to wrestle with. These very human questions of how do our actions, what we do and what we say relate to our faith? What does it mean to believe in the person and the way of Jesus Christ? And these are big questions that often get framed with big theological words and debates. Um, it has throughout his Christian history, and those of you who know me well know I'm enough of a nerd that I love having those conversations. Just ask Scott. Um, <laughs> so, give Scott a break, and if you want to have those conversations, my door is always open. That's why I enjoy doing campus ministry. I love having those conversations. But I don't think that's what James is about. I think James is practical and pushes us beyond this binary thinking of faith versus works. I don't think that's what he is getting at because we know that God's grace goes before us, empowering us to grow and learn and trust and act in love. We know this as Wesleyan Christians, as United Methodists. We call John Wesley our founder who talked about prevenient grace, this grace that goes before us. So we're always in that grace. But I believe this scripture pushes us towards admitting important truths about who we are, the fundamental reality that what we put our trust in will be reflected in our lives. It's just a fundamental reality. Our lives will reflect our core beliefs. They will give us away, so to speak, if our core beliefs aren't the way of Jesus Christ. One way to put this question, does your life and your witness, do your actions and your words tell us that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life? That is what James is getting at. I think he's helping us, this book is helping us to see that believing is more than just an intellectual enterprise. I work with college students, I love those intellectual conversations. But believing is more than simply a list of propositions, things that we might say, I believe that and I believe that. The heart of believing for James is how we view and treat other people. In this particular selection from James, he's dealing with a couple of different problems, which I think we could relate to. He's dealing with this idea of how we might pay more attention to one person or another. And he uses the example of a rich person. If a rich person came into your assembly or to your worship service, it would be a synagogue in the original language. If he'd come into your synagogue and he's wealthy and has you know, fine clothes and fine rings and this type of thing, do you defer to them and ignore someone who comes in who appears to be poor and in ragged clothes and that type of thing? And sometimes we do that, right? Sometimes we would defer to someone that appears to be wealthy and we would tend to ignore someone who appears to be poor. But we actually might do it the other way around because sometimes we might see someone who is really wealthy and we think, well, they're kind of pretentious. I don't really want to deal with them. I, I can't relate to them. So it doesn't always work the same way that James is laying it out, but he's using it as a metaphor on how we deal with people differently based on the way we perceive them. And that, we cannot deny, happens. 
We, de de we determine how much worth we think somebody is based on something about them. Maybe the way they're dressed, but it may be a different race or a different class or a different gender or they're from a different profession. Sometimes we favor, favor the wealthy and think somehow they must be very wise because they've accumulated all this money. Or sometimes we defer to people who have a perceived sense of power because we think they can make a difference. For me, this is some, there's something to be gained by showing partiality to this person. Or someone who seems wiser or more, they have more degrees after their name. And no offense to any of my professors here. Okay, Because this is, this is not what it's about. But if we look at that and we think they're somehow better than other people because of their training or their education or their wealth or their clothes... We have sinned, according to what James says. We have sinned because we've devalued someone else in the process. Most of you probably know because you've heard me talk for several years now, but I, I was in sales for over 20 years. And during my sales career, I learned some really vital things about this. One of which is in my first job, I called on the Macy's department store. You know, kind of high-end department store. And when I went to see the buyer at Macy's, I would put on my best suit and tie and I would take them to the finest restaurants in Kansas City where I was working. Because that's what they expected. If I came in wearing a t-shirt and jeans, they would think I was the stock boy or something. I wasn't there to actually sell them any product. But then later, at another job, I worked called on manufacturers. Do you know what they say if you come in with a coat and tie on to a manufacturer? They start whispering, the suit's here. <laughs> Don't trust a suit. It was completely judged by what the clothes I had on. It had nothing to do with what I knew or what I could help them with. But they did not want me walking in their door wearing a tie. They wanted me to look like someone who was willing to go out on the factory floor and help them solve a problem. I needed to dress more like the shop foreman, not like the business executive that Macy's might expect. And so this idea of people judging people by the way they look is something that it's hard for us to, to admit sometimes, but we know it's true. We know that it happens. There's distinctions made in hiring people. Now, some of you have owned businesses and you've hired people your, your whole life and you know many of these pitfalls, but I had an older friend at a previous church. He's no longer alive, so this story can't get back to him. But... He once said to me, when he, had, when he owned a business, and he had an applicant for a job, and if he had these two resumes for this particular job, and both these people seem to have the exact same uh, experience, education, qualifications to do the job, but one was a man and one was a woman, he said, I would always ho hire the man. Now, I know that's hard for us to accept, but that's, some people still think that way. That when it comes right down to it, they will hire the man first. And no offense to the ladies, we'll be trying very hard to fix this. But it still happens. And you can't always catch people at it. You don't know why they're, why they're making the decisions. The statistics tell us that when a, a company gets, a, like a hiring manager gets a bunch of different resumes, that if he will select the ones with the Anglo names over the ones that have names from other uh, nationalities, like Hispanic or Arabic or African American, the Anglo names get called first for the interviews. It's illegal, but how can you catch people doing it? You can't. So the church needs to rise above these things. The church needs to rise above these problems. The church needs to be the leaders in trying to be equitable for all people. Not that you treat all people exactly the same, but you treat them with equity. That you look at their qualifications and without regard to their gender or their race or any other qualifications, they're tall or they're short or whatever. There's all these different ways that we judge people. And James points this out very clearly. If you do so, you have sinned because you've somehow diminished the value of the other people. And this is where I think the church can help lead this. No matter how many laws we pass related to anti-discrimination in work, it still happens because you can't prove what they did. But we know that it happens. So Paul, or not Paul, James says, 
you do really well if you fulfill the royal law. Now what he's referring to is the law when Jesus was asked, what is the greatest of the commandments? And he said, to love, the God, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love who? Your neighbor as yourself. Neighbors aren't just the people that look like us or act like us or think like us. The neighbor, neighbors are all of God's children. Anyone of any, of any description. All need to be treated with equity. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You shall see everyone as having worth. In the eyes of God, that is what James is driving at. In kind of a way that makes us go ouch a little bit, I think. And of course, that's the heart of our Christian faith. And of course, we would affirm that. Yes, we believe that. But what does it look like to have skin in the game, so to speak, with that understanding? What are the implications of seeing and not seeing everyone as having worth? What are the implications for ourselves and for others? You see, James calls out what we do and what we fail to do. Towards the end of this passage, there's this, this little zinger that, that keeps coming back to me. If one is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs. Yeah, that one, that one pokes a little bit. When we don't see someone as having full worth, we become inauthentic. Our words and our actions don't match. It's seen in what we do and what we fail to do. How many of us, because I know I have done this, when a friend or an acquaintance is in need, we find out, have we said, is, if there's anything I can do, let me know how I can help. Now, sometimes we say that with all true sincerity and a true desire to, if there's a way I can help, let me know. But sometimes, if we're honest with ourselves, we say it to let ourselves off the hook of really having to wrestle with what that person's true needs are. Or we assume that we know how we might best be able to help we know best, as opposed to having to really find out what this person's needs are. I do this. I had a friend recently diagnosed with COVID, and I found myself sending a message. If there's anything I can do, please let me know, because I know this isn't a fun experience. And the response I got back was, thank you. I think we're good, but would you please pray? Now, I know sometimes the whole idea of I'm praying for you or my thoughts and prayers are with you gets a bad rap. Um, and sometimes appropriately so. Sometimes um, that I will pray for you can be a, uh, a response that is condescending. Um, I don't know how many of you are originally from the South, but at least some folks stereotypically in the South, it's the, oh, bless your heart, I will pray for you. I know I've been on the recipient end of that a couple of times when someone did not agree with me and, and what I heard was, I'll pray for you. <laughs> I knew exactly what that meant, by the way. But this wasn't the case in this friend asking me for prayer. In this case, honoring someone, seeing them as having worth, meant honoring their understanding of their most pressing need. And so I prayed and we'll continue to pray because that's what it means. One example of what it means to put ourselves aside and wrestle with what it means to truly see others, those like us and those not like us, friends and acquaintances and people that we would not see eye to eye with. It's what it means and that's why I think the book of James can be a little pokey. I don't know, it poked at me this week a little bit. <laughs> and this passage can seem like a downer. It can feel like we're always getting it wrong and where is the hope and how we get it right? Well, our God is a God of grace. Our God is a God that continually helps us learn and grow in faith and God's grace does not leave us alone to figure these things out. We do it in a community together, a community that shapes and changes us 
God's grace that is in and around in all that we do. And we see that, I think, most clearly when we come to Holy Communion together with folks that we can see in the pews and with folks that we can't see, those who are worshiping online. We see this as we come together in prayer, as we come together acknowledging that God meets us exactly where we are. As we approach the Holy Communion table, we know that God has called all of us, and yet all of us need to, to examine ourselves as we come before to receive God's grace, to know in what areas we're struggling, and to be reminded of those things. And so we always have a prayer of confession as we approach the table, and it, you'll find it in your bulletin. Let's read this together. Generous God, we, we confess, confess that though we desire to be your kingdom, kingdom community, community we, we often, often miss the mark through what we do and say and through, through what we leave unsaid and undone. Forgive, forgive us. Forgive, forgive us that we may open ourselves to unexpected experiences and teachers, to fresh ideas, to one another and to you. Transform us that our very lives may witness to your abundant love. Hear this good news. Know that you are forgiven always and free to begin anew. Through Christ, God's everlasting mercy and love. Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Amen. Amen. And now, as God's forgiven and reconciled children, we invite you to pass the peace of Christ in our online comments or in the room. Simply turn and wave, maybe some, some air fist bumps, whatever you may want this morning. But with these words, the peace of Christ be with you. And, and also, also with, with you. you. The peace of Christ be with you. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he met in the upper room with his disciples to celebrate the Passover. And they gathered there as they had probably in previous years, and the uh, Jewish people continue to do this today, to remember that God continues to deliver them through each and every hardship that they went through. It specifically refers to their being released from captivity in Egypt, but it goes on beyond that to talk about how God delivers us how God sustains us, how God continues to guide us if we allow God to do that. And it was during that dinner that Jesus got down on his knees and washed the feet of his disciples, something completely uncharacteristic for a rabbi to do. This would be something that one of the servants would have normally done, but Jesus wanted to make a point. He wanted to show them what it truly means to be a servant leader to lead through allowing yourself to be humbled, to, to lift someone up by showing attention to them, by paying attention to their needs, what they truly need at that moment. And if you walked all day in sandals on a dusty, rocky road, you probably need your feet washed, and it would feel so good. And then he says, I give you a new commandment, to love one another as I have loved you as James is identified as the royal law, to love one another as we, have, as we have been loved by God. And so we invite you to find your communion elements, whatever you have at home, bread or juice, cracker and grapes, or for those here, your bags, and you can simply lift those, hold them in your hand for the moment. For there have been some times and places where we take one loaf and we break it, but in these times we take our many pieces lifting them, trusting in the power of the Holy Spirit to bring us together as one. In other times, we would take a single cup and all would drink from the same cup. And today we have our individual fruit of the vine that's in your, uh, in your hands there, in your home, wherever you are celebrating this Holy Communion with us. We know that represents the blood of Christ shed for all. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray that you pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and juice or crackers and grapes, whatever is assembled at the altars of the homes throughout our community and around the world and in the hands of those here in the sanctuary. Lord, let them be mysteriously the body and blood of Jesus Christ within us, that as we go forth from this place, we will be doers of the word, not hearers only. 
that we'll be the people that reach out in generosity and humility and we accept others and give them value and worth. We know that each and every one of us are your children and we go forth proudly proclaiming that, that we are your children of God through your son Jesus Christ our Savior in whose name we pray, amen. Amen. And now we do what we might do at a family table and pause to bless our meal together. Let us pray. Our Father, Father who, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, come thy, thy will be done, be done on earth as it is, is in heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread and, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive, forgive those who trespass, trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now we feast. Christ's body broken that the many may become one. Take and eat with joy. The body of Christ. In the same manner, we take the fruit of the vine and we receive that as the blood of Christ. There's something beautiful about our thirst being quenched physically and spiritually in these moments. We hope and pray that as we have done so, you have encountered Jesus Christ and the grace of our Lord. As you are ready, we invite you to pray together. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us, one body gathered in you. Grant that we may go into our days in the strength of our spirit, to give, give ourselves, ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If you would take your hymnals, the red hymnal, turn to page 356 or your online bullets, and let's stand and sing, When We Are Living. We belong to God. And so we go dispersed once again out into whatever this week may hold. We go pushed by the power of the Holy Spirit. We go knowing that we are of worth. We go with the command to love God and love neighbor. We go 
with this commission to see everyone we encounter as of worth in the eyes of God, go. And I, me I meant to mention that Rebecca Stringer was playing piano for us today. She's our guest pianist, and we thank her for being here today. Very nice. Let's hear a blessing for you all. As we journey together seeking peace and justice for all, may God, our creator, renew in us the creative spirit that brings healing and life to all the creation. May Jesus the Christ sustain us in boundless grace and love. May the Holy Spirit fill us with courage to be bearers of God's hope in the world. Amen. Amen. Lord, bind us together in law.